Hello everyone, welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. Please like, share and subscribe for more exciting content. Today, we'll be looking into a criminal who doubled up as a DJ in a club, Mr. Lee Harrison, better known by his moniker, Hooligan X. Mr. Lee Harrison was born on the 8th of March, 1966. He was of mixed race. His mother was of a Burmese Portuguese origin and his father, Mr. Tom Harrison, is by his own admission an old villain who has spent much of his life cycling in and out of jail, including a 30 month sentence for conspiracy to supply drugs from Pakistan in the early 80s, but more about the drugs later. Mr. Harrison grew up in the North Ormsby area of the town, which now has the enviable record of being one of the cheapest places to buy a house in the UK. During Mr. Harrison's childhood, it was a solid working class neighborhood where everybody knew everyone, where doors were left unlocked and children would play football or ride their bikes in the streets. Mr. Harrison was an excellent junior boxer. He was known for his looks and didn't like getting hit in the face. Being handy with his fists came in useful a few years later when he got involved in football hooliganism. The Middlesbrough front line followed their beloved team around the country, fighting pitched battles against rival fans. He said, we would get guys from all the nearby estates, says Mr. Paul Slater, who was a member of the front line. It wasn't about the violence, it was about gaining respect for our hometown. And Mr. Harrison loved it. He loved the attention. It was those bloody Saturday afternoons that inspired his MC name, Hooligan X. It was around this time that Mr. Harrison drew a close bond with Mr. Lee Duffy, a former boxer, bouncer, and gangster who was known as one of the most feared men on the Teesside estate in the 80s. For more about Lee Duffy, do check out his video on our channel. Mr. Harrison left school with no qualifications and immediately started helping his dad out in the copying game. At one stage, it was mainly counterfeit clothing. They used to get bundles of gear, tracksuits and trainers, and that was the fashion then, and they'd sell it all over the Northeast. But they also had a sideline in fake Rolex watches and perfumes. They would get the bottles in Romania, the essence from France, and the boxes were made in Birmingham. It was all done professionally, it would cost you about two quid to make a bottle of Coco Chanel. It was a life of crime that paid for the flash clothes, fast cars and fancy foreign trips, but music was always Mr. Harrison's passion. As a six year old when they were invited to weddings, he'd be on the dance floor and he was unbelievable. Mr. Harrison's love of music was inherited from his dad. Mr. Tom Harrison ran the doors at the Speakeasy, a nightclub that later became the Havana, and had a huge record collection. The pair listened to reggae, particularly Bob Marley at the time. Mr. Harrison spent summers working in Spanish resorts. He started by handing out flyers for nightclubs, but graduated to working as a DJ. People just wanted to dance their tits off all night, says Mr. Allen, who accompanied Lee on one of the trips and was later to become a DJ at the Havana. They were just lost in the music. It was in places like Ibiza and Tenerife that many British clubbers first experimented with ecstasy and later started taking it back to the UK. During his time in Spain, Mr. Harrison mixed with DJs who were later to become some of the biggest names in the British club scene. In Middlesbrough, a local club owner put him in charge of entertainment at the Havana and later the arena nightclub in town. The 1990s proved to be boom times. The money was rolling in. But it all came to a shocking end for Lee in 2001. It was called the second summer of love. 1989, a new genre of music is sweeping through nightclubs across Britain. It's reached the gritty northern English town of Middlesbrough and the Havana nightclub is packed and bouncing. The synthesized beat produced by the Roland TB303 baseline machine is vibrating through the walls and clubbers are dazzled and blinded by strobe lights, disco balls and smoke machines. The Havana is like a furnace inside. Condensation is dripping from the ceiling, sweat is pouring down the clubbers' faces but they're completely entranced by the music. The scene is inspired by house music, a genre of electronic dance music pioneered in the US city of Chicago in the early 1980s, but it's also being fueled by the appearance of a little white pill ecstasy. It's illegal, but over the years it's been blamed for many deaths. Its use has sparked a moral panic across Britain at the time. Headlines appear in the newspapers warning about the evils of ecstasy, but many of the clubbers at the Havana don't care. It's their drug of choice, creating a feeling of euphoria that lasts for hours. 
Dancing beside the DJ box is MC Hooligan X, Mr. Lee Harrison. He is a devilishly good looking guy and it's his job to whip up the crowd. He revels in it. He's like a prince who has found his people. You chill, I chill, on a pill, we all chill chill, on a pill pill. He raps into the microphone and the crowd lap it up like a collective communion. They respond with shrill blasts from their whistles, their ears are ringing but they can't get enough of it. Even when the police of the fire brigade raid the club, old Bill, old Bill everyone shouts and Hooligan X starts rapping. It's a coded warning, the drug dealers peddling ecstasy scurry into the shadows and stash their supplies. The fire exit pops open and Mr Harrison was a face everyone knew around Middlesbrough. He was often seen bombing around town in his open top convertible with the music blaring. Lee would get where the wind doesn't get but in a lovely cheeky way, says his childhood friend Mr Alan Appleton. He was a good looking lad and could get any woman he wanted. You would see photographs of him with Mike Tyson and you would just snigger. But for all of Lee's charm there was a violent side to him. Someone who knew him said that he had pulled a gun on him during an argument. A friend recalls Mr Harrison spiking his drink with hallucinogenic drugs for a laugh. There's always been a dark sinister side to the nightlife, everybody misses that time, says one former regular at the club. It was a feeling of being all loved up but it became a very intimidating scene. This was the dangerous world that Mr Lee Harrison had now moved in all of his life, but it would catch up to him more than 25 years later. Mr Harrison was soon to be embroiled in a sea of crimes and controversies and is even accused of orchestrating a sinister and violent murder. It's been described as one of Middlesbrough's most notorious murders. A 41 year old market trader Calvont Singh was found dead after falling from the window of a house in the town but it soon became clear that it was no accident and he had been pushed out of the window. A local news website said that Mr Singh had found himself in the middle of a so called turf war concerning the supply, distribution and sale of drugs to prostitutes in Teesside and Middlesbrough. Four men were wanted in connection with the murder. One of them was Mr Harrison. He went on the run to Scotland, South Africa, Amsterdam and finally to Jamaica. His family used to take holidays on the island and had friends there. After a year Mr Harrison was arrested and extradited back to the UK. In 2004 he received a 9 year jail sentence after pleading guilty to manslaughter, grievous bodily harm and wounding. His father was also in prison for several years for trying to silence witnesses. Mr Lee was freed from jail in 2009 and settled in Portsmouth. He was married to Tamara whom he had met while on the run in Jamaica. He told friends that he was going to turn over a new leaf. He wanted to go straight and he found work as an electrical cable fitter. But things didn't work out as he planned and in 2015 Mr Harrison's marriage was falling apart. A few days before Christmas he boarded a flight to Lebanon. He said he was going to spend the holiday with a Lebanese friend in the Becca Valley. It was a journey that ultimately cost him his life. Some 3,700 kilometers from Middlesbrough lies Lebanon's magnificent Becca Valley. Running for 121 kilometers, it's flanked by snow capped mountains on one side and war torn Syria in the east. The Becca has long been known as the country's breadbasket, famed for its Roman ruins and world class wineries. But it's also a wild frontier, a place where the police often fear to tread. There are thousands of outstanding arrest warrants that the Lebanese call them the Farron, the fugitives. And if you know the right people in the Becca you can get away with almost anything. Crime flourishes in this impoverished region, smuggling over treacherous mountain paths is a rite of passage for many. One of the valley towns is infamous for being a hub for stolen cars, but it's what you find at the feet of Mount Lebanon's slopes that brings us here. Acres and acres of lush green cannabis plants producing some of the finest resin in the world. Mr Harrison came to the Becca to stay at the home of a man called Adonis Al Masri. Mr Al Masri has a brown gingery beard but if you looked closely you'd see it was covering scars. As a teenager in the 1980s he was caught up in one of the bloody feuds that frequently erupt among the Becca's sprawling families which control the valley. 
Mr. Al Masari was shot in the face. He's had dozens of skin graft operations to try and repair the damage done to his jaw. A relative says that the traumatic event warped his life and ever since he's relied on drink and drugs to numb the pain and combat depression. They say he's a volatile character prone to mood swings. Mr. Al Masri and Mr. Harrison knew each other from the time in the United Kingdom. On one occasion, Mr. Al Masri was introduced by Mr. Harrison to his father at a birthday party held at an Italian restaurant in London's West End. Mr. Tom Harrison's first impression was that Mr. Al Masri seemed alright. It was a view shared by others. But during the UK inquest after Mr. Harrison's death, Mr. Harrison's half brother, Mr. Gerald Copeman, was quoted as saying that Mr. Al Masri claimed to have killed the man who had shot him in the face. Several friends also recall Mr. Al Masri bragged to the ties of Hezbollah, the Lebanese Shia organization whose military wing is des designated a terrorist organization by the UK and many other countries across the globe. Perhaps most bizarrely of all, Mr. Al Masri boasted of having helped free the British hostage Mr. Terry Waite, who was held in Lebanon during the Civil War in the 1980s. Whatever the truth, Mr. Al Masri is one of the most prominent and powerful families in Bekaa Valley. His great grandfather, Mr. Mohim Qasim Al Masri, was hailed as a courageous freedom fighter against Lebanon's former Ottoman and French occupiers. Mr. Al Masri's grandfather, Mr. Naif Al Masri, was a member of the Lebanese parliament from 1960 to 1972. Remember that name, we'll be returning to him a bit later on. Mr. Al Masri himself has political ties. He organised gatherings at his home for one of the main Lebanese political parties during the recent election. He posted pictures of himself on social media with top politicians. Anybody seeing these pictures would be left with the impression that Mr. Al Masri is a man with powerful friends. Like almost everyone else in the Becca, Mr. Al Masri had access to guns. It's a way of life up in the valley. There was a wide array of submachine guns and rocket launchers, as well as an innumerable number of pistols and grenades. On the right hand side of the balcony, there was also a pile said to be about 5 high and 6 feet wide of brown coloured powder. Well you guessed it right, it was cannabis, that drug that Mr. Adonis and Mr. Lee mainly peddled to earn a living. Mr. Lee was not in Becca to celebrate Christmas after all. According to his family, he was in fact in Lebanon to do a drug deal. Four months later, it would all go tragically wrong. Of all the illicit activity for which the Becca is renowned, nothing surpasses its drug production. The UN ranks Lebanon as the world's third largest producer of hashish, a psychoactive substance smoked or ingested, made from cannabis resin. Lebanon is also a significant producer of phenothylene, an amphetamine-like pill, better known as Captagon, and a transit hub for cocaine and heroin. It's hashish above all, that's what's made Lebanon's name in the international drug world. In July 2018, the consulting firm McKinsey proposed legalising its cultivation and sale for medicinal use in order to invigorate Lebanon's stagnant economy. The economy minister said it would amount to a billion dollar industry, praising the quality of local produce as one of the best in the world. In the freewheeling late 60s, at the time of Woodstock, the Summer of Love and the radical counterculture, Lebanese hash was in vogue. Pilgrims would take it across the hippie trail by minibus from Europe to Lebanon, seeking enlightenment at the source, before journeying on to Afghanistan, India and beyond. The Brotherhood of Eternal Love, a zany Californian group of surfers, stoners and drug dealers dubbed the Hippie Mafia, was said by the US Drug Enforcement Administration to have imported almost two tons of Lebanese hash to the US by the early 70s. Other notable buyers included the car heiress Miss Christina von Opel, arrested in St. Tropez in 1977 with 1.6 tons of Lebanese hash and the former Welsh smuggler and spy turned author Mr. Howard Marks, who arranged the transportation of hundreds of kilos of the drug using Lebanese diplomats, according to Mr. Jonathan Marshall in his book The Lebanese Connection, Corruption, Civil War and the International Drug Traffic. The Lebanese Civil War, which took place between 1975 and 1990, was a great boon to the industry, with the collapse of state authority and the rise of rapacious militias with few scruples about making money by any means. The area of farmland used for the hash cultivation grew to four times its pre-war size, estimated at 10,000 hectares, 
roughly the size of 10,000 rugby pitches. Not just hash, but heroin too, began to be produced in large quantities there, and the warlords who controlled the supply lines and seaports amassed vast fortunes. After the war, the heroin was mostly stamped out, and the hash farmland much reduced, though far from eradicated. Recent years have seen the introduction of Captagon, a, a simulant reportedly consumed by fighters in the Syrian conflict, as well as recreational users in the Gulf Arab states. Captagon was originally the name of a pharmaceutical drug used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and narcolepsy, but it was banned in most countries during the 1980s because of its addictive properties. Now, Captagon is reportedly the most popular drug consumed in the Gulf countries and Saudi Arabia. While these deeply conservative Islamic states take a strict, zero-tolerance approach towards all intoxicants, users appear to be drawn to Captagon in the belief they're taking medication. Throughout these decades, the illegality of the drug trade has been circumvented by official corruption, at times implicating figures in Lebanon's highest offices, and members of the Al Masri clan have played their own part. Remember Adonis' grandfather, Mr. Naif Al Masri, the Lebanese MP? Well, in 1970, a plane was seized in Crete carrying more than half a ton of hashish, worth more than $1 million at the time. According to the book, The Secret War Against Dope by Mr. Andrew Tully, the plane had taken off from a freshly constructed airstrip on Mr. Naif's estate in the Becca. It appears then that Mr. Adonis was no stranger to the world of drugs. A relative was quoted at Mr. Harrison's inquest as saying that the family owns a cannabis farm. As for Mr. Harrison, he was approaching 50 years old and felt he was running out of time to make his mark. He told Mr. Gerald that his deal was going to be the big one and it was do or die this time. Mr. Harrison's plan for Lebanon was straightforward enough. He would fly out there in late 2015 to oversee a drug deal with the help of his host, Mr. Al Masari. But upon reaching the Becca Valley, Mr. Harrison's plan began to quickly unravel and before he knew it, strange things started to happen to Mr. Harrison. In January 2016, he was abducted at gunpoint and interrogated for several hours by people with American accents. He believed they were working for the CIA. The following month, while applying for a routine extension to his tourist visa, he claimed his passport was taken by the Lebanese authorities on the grounds that he was wanted by Interpol. British police later asserted that he was never in fact wanted by the organisation. These bizarre developments, coupled with an imploding marriage back home, started taking their psychological toll on Mr. Harrison, and he went downhill massively. He had lost a lot of weight and would appear unkept on video calls and at odds with his reputation for sharp dressing. A family member was quoted at the inquest as saying that Lee had told him that he had had a smoke on a few occasions, and that he had taken that as a reference to cannabis. The coroner speculated that if this was the case, it could have further fueled Lee's mood swings. A member of the Al Masri family claimed that about a month before his death, Mr. Harrison had to be dragged down from a ladder after attempting to hang himself. At other times, friends remember him rambling incoherently about being held by ISIS and the Taliban. He didn't sound like the same Lee that we knew, said one of his friends. Towards the end, the court was told Mr. Harrison grew convinced his host had turned on him thinking that he was an undercover agent. He mentioned in a phone call, they're all whispering and talking about me and saying about taking me away and having something done. In his final days, things escalated dramatically. Lee told another half-brother by text message on the 15th of April that his host has had me done in over here. His brother replied, you need to get out as soon as possible. The next day, Mr. Harrison fled the house, stabbing a gardener in the process only to be knocked down seconds later by a car in the street. Mr. Harrison told his family that he had briefly gone to hospital. The court heard that after the reported incident, Mr. Harrison was moved to the home of Shahid Habshi in the nearby village of Deir al hamar and Mr. Habshi describes himself as a friend of the Al-Masri family. Mr. Harrison at this time grew fixated with death, asking one friend to look after his kids and telling his father, Mr. Tom Harrison, to have his body and blood checked in the event of his demise. In contrast, Mr. Shahid Habshi said that Lee was happy in his household, 
eating healthily and bonding with his hosts over food, even teaching them how to make fish soup. On the 20th of April 2016, Mr. Shahid said that he went out to buy some honey at the request of Mr. Harrison. When he came back, he found Mr. Harrison hanging from his front door. The Lebanese authorities later declared it a suicide, though Mr. Harrison's father and half-brother Mr. Gerald insist to this day that he was murdered. In the aftermath of his death, hundreds of mourners gathered at St. John's Church in the heart of Middlesbrough to give Mr. Harrison his final send-off on the 20th of May 2016. Pallbearers carried his coffin into the church to the sound of Natural Mystic by Bob Marley. The mourners heard about Mr. Harrison's devotion to his three children, delivering the eulogy a friend said Mr. Harrison lived an action-packed 50 years. He was streetwise and had a special bond with his dad, wheeling and dealing, that was the family trade. Back in Lebanon, the authorities were investigating a news report in the local Daily Star newspaper on the day that Mr. Harrison died. It said that it was initially believed that he had taken his own life, but it quoted doctors as saying that they didn't believe that he had killed himself. The first medical examiner was inconclusive. He could not determine whether Mr. Harrison had taken his own life or been murdered. He told the news agencies, both UK and Lebanese, that he was not happy about the process, but would not comment any further. Two other medical examiners later concluded that Mr. Harrison killed himself. A UK pathologist who examined Mr. Harrison's body agreed that it was likely he died from hanging. When his body was returned to Teesside, pathologist Dr. Peter Nigel Cooper examined it, and he mentioned that there were no self-defense injuries which would be consistent with an attack. He added that Mr. Harrison would have been difficult to strangle, as well as other common sense factors, so dismissed the idea of murder. For those reasons, ligature strangulation was unlikely and hanging was likely, added the expert. However, Mr. Harrison's dad dismissed the idea of suicide, adding, Of course I believe he was going to be murdered. I know my son was murdered. I believe it. I know my son and there's no way he would take his own life. He lived for his children, he had so much to live for, and he was a happy-go-lucky guy. Mr. Adonis Almasari questioned by Lebanese police and denied having any business ties with Mr. Harrison. The BBC repeatedly contacted the Lebanese businessman, who unsurprisingly has no criminal record for comment, but he didn't respond to the requests. In the UK, the inquest into Mr. Harrison's death returned an open verdict in December 2017. The coroner said, there is no evidence Mr. Harrison was unlawfully killed, but I can't be certain that he intended to take his own life. She also said that it was the opinion of the British police that it was highly likely that Mr. Harrison was involved in some organised criminality whilst in Lebanon. During the inquest, half-brother Mr. Gerald said in a statement, Lee is like a 10% man. He would introduce people to people. He told me this. I think Adonis did the introduction to the main supplier or cultivator, the main source. So why did things end so badly? Well, the inquest heard that a relative of Mr. Adonis al Mazri told the British police that Mr. Adonis had in fact stolen £150,000 from Mr. Harrison, causing the drug deal to collapse. Mr. Gerald also strongly believed that Mr. Harrison was the surety, the living surety, and because it never happened, they made an example of him. The reality is we'll probably never know what exactly happened in these final days. But Mr. Lee's father is in little doubt. He says, I know my son and there is no way he would take his own life. He had too much to live for and he loved his children. We still do not know for sure whether the drug deal was for cannabis or captagon or indeed something else, but Mr. Tom Harrison believed the drug deal was for MDMA or ecstasy. Lebanon is not known for producing that specific drug, although seizures of ecstasy are on the increase in the country. The shadowy world of illicit drugs is constantly evolving and throwing up surprises. And Mr. Lee Harrison had travelled a long way from those early euphoric nights at the Havana Club. But in the end, it may have been the ecstasy that killed Hooligan X. A club promoter, Ricky Magowan, who works in Glasgow, was pals with Lee for 30 years. He said that Lee is a big hero up here with a lot of friends. He was a great friend to me and a lot of people up here. 
We're planning on having our own party up here and we'll be inviting anybody from Middlesbrough who wants to join us. I'm going to speak to the family about it before pitting out the arrangements. Tributes were also paid on social media. Miss Amanda Britton said that the world's lost a legend and Borough has lost a legend. Rest in peace, Lee Harrison. Miss Lee Foza said that I cannot believe we lost yet another great lad. He meant a lot to a lot of people, not just in Middlesbrough, but all around the UK. MC Lee Harrison, I'll raise a glass tonight for you until we meet again. Thank you for the memories from the Borough Frontline days to raving in Salou. And another Netzian, Mr. Mark Foster said, rest in peace Lee Harrison. A true lifelong friend with so many great memories and one of the top doggy lads. Till we meet again big man. Posts were also placed on the Borrow fan page, Fly Me to the Moon. One poster said, Heard the sad news this morning that Leah died. Lived the high life, but missed his doggy life. Not a saint, but had more friends than enemies. His dad pleaded with him to leave Lebanon after spotting AK-47s and RPGs during a web chat. Mr. Harrison's life saw him rub shoulders with gangland figures like Lee Duffy and his pal, Mr. James Rowan, who he met inside the Kirk Livington prison. He revealed at the inquest that Mr. Harrison told him ISIS and Hezbollah had threatened him. Mr. Rowan said that he wanted to warn British police but feared the claims were too far-fetched to believe. But in a statement, Mr. Rowan said he did not trust the host who Lee was with. He said that he had previously met one of the hosts and that he told him he was from a powerful family and part of Hezbollah and that he had access to firearms. And Mr. Tom Harrison claimed his son feared the hosts were going to do him in over suspicions that he was an undercover policeman. Mr. Tom Harrison vowed to fight for his son's inquest to be reopened after Teesside's coroner's court heard that the 50 year old had been involved in a £150,000 drug deal involving cannabis while staying in Lebanon with a powerful family that boasted links to Hezbollah. However, the truth of the matter is that Lee is the only person who will ever know what happened. Paying tribute to his son, he said that he had always tried to encourage him to stay on the straight and narrow, adding, You could not have met a better lad than my son. He was very loyal to me, and he never wanted for anything. Tom Harrison has attacked the investigation by Lebanese police, accusing them of making a number of alarming errors that led them to reaching a verdict of suicide. He is also questioned by British officials and not helped him access his son's preliminary autopsy reports, his passport, and phone, raising suspicions of a cover-up. He added, even the dates which these family members are all saying was the day Lee was killed in is three days before the actual day he died. How is that possible? And why do they need three doctors to examine the body, he said. There is too much that is just bungled in this case. So was Hooligan X murdered in Lebanon after a CIA blunder led to a criminal gang mistaking him for a spy? Or was he simply a prey to the class A drugs that had been consumed? Let us know what you think in the comments section and let us know what you think about Mr. Harrison's death. If you enjoyed the video, drop us a like and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content. And as always, stay safe.